Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 3, Biological Diversity. This is technically video one um, on abiotic factors. Our learning intention for this video is that you would be able to predict the effects of abiotic selection pressures on organisms in ecosystems. And that's a very generalized learning intention and obviously you're going to need to apply it to a number of specific examples that we look at in the classroom. But for now, let's um, continue with our little bit of an introduction into ecosystems to just set ourselves the context and the foundation for where we're going in this particular module. So ecosystems, whilst I, I was a little disparaging about ecosystems in the last video, nevertheless, they're a great tool for study and are a great tool for ecologists and biologists to understand what's going on in different environments and how the different animals and plants interact with one another. Ecosystems are limited by abiotic factors. And you might remember one of the key um, factors that affects the distribution and abundance of organisms is limiting factors. The, the ability of different organisms to be able to tolerate certain conditions uh, in their physical and chemical environment, uh, whether it's the amount of water, whether it's temperature, whether it's amount of light, those sorts of things. Now, having said that most ecosystems are limited by the abiotic factors, they're actually defined by a key biotic factor, that is the dominant plant species. Now, this isn't exclusively the case, but it is more often than not the case. Most of the uh, ecosystems that we study are really dominated by one major species. Now, if it's a grassland, it's obviously going to be the grass, the type of grass predominantly that we're going to be looking at as the dominant species uh, in woodlands. There may be a range of different types of trees, but they may all um, correspond or, or belong to the same uh, group. And, um, and even in a rainforest, which has such a huge diversity, often we still define uh, each of these uh, ecosystems by those dominant plant species that we see there. So ecosystems are limited by abiotic factors and defined by their biotic factors. And that's one of the reasons why setting up things like uh, food chains and food webs are so critically important because the producers that are at the base of each of these food webs are going to affect the other organisms um, that are part of that ecosystem. We want to have a look at some Australian examples. We'll do mostly uh, this inside of the classroom, but just to give you a quick run through, obviously the Barrier Reef is a fantastic ecosystem, which is part of Australia. Australia has desert ecosystems. It has tropical rainforest ecosystems. It has grasslands. It has heathlands. It has temperate uh, forests. And certainly a lot of dry sclerophyll forests are what dominates um, much of uh, the Australian uh, biota. So we are very much interested in having a look at some different examples of uh, each of these different types of ecosystems, trying to keep in our mind as we do this, the fact that um, some very important abiotic factors are going to impact on the distribution and abundance of a large number of organisms. So if we're going to get into this um, nitty gritty of not, not so much the ecology of the environment, but more the um, evolution, more the shifting in populations over time, then we need to understand something about Darwin's theory of natural selection. So remember, evolution's not Darwin's idea. It wasn't a new idea when, when um, Darwin came up with natural selection or his survival of the fittest kind of idea. Uh, it was an idea that had been around for some time. But what Darwin was able to do was provide this mechanism, this theory that explained the observations that we see. And remember, that's the key thing about theories. Theories are explanatory. They should explain observations. If they can't explain the observations, then they, then they either need to be modified or, or discarded. But Darwin's theory of natural selection explains a lot of what we see in uh, ecosystems. And so let's just revisit it quickly. So three key points that we want to look at in terms of natural selection. The first one is variation, and obviously variation is very important. You need to have populations of individuals that are not all identical, that are not all clones. Selection has to operate on variation. If they're all the same, then anything that happens is going to affect all individuals equally. You're not going to get any change in the population. So we have to have variation, and generally speaking, 
we, we include in that idea of variation, there are usually too many individuals produced that can then can survive into the next generation. So some of them are going to be kind of culled along the way. Um, there's various ways that that can happen, um, but usually it's, it's one of those things. If every single uh, individual that's born um, lives to reproductive age, passes all of their genes on, then you're just going to have a continual stirring of the population gene pool. Um, you're not going to get any significant changes or certainly any um, selection for one uh, trait over another. So we have to have variation. We have to have uh, limits uh, around the numbers of survivors in each of those um, generations. But then we need a selecting agent or a selecting pressure, something in the environment that's actually going to favour some individuals over others. And these selecting agents can be both abiotic and biotic. And we're going to have, uh, there's so many variations on those that, that the biotic ones need a separate video of their own, so they'll get one. Uh, and in this case, we're going to try and see if we can focus on some of the abiotic factors that may act as selecting agents in, um, in creating certain pressure uh, for uh, change within populations. And of course, um, if you're going to have something that selects some individuals to be better suited than others, then you need um, genes to be passed on. Those individuals that, for whatever reason, are better suited in the environment need to be able to pass that advantage on into the next generation, and so therefore their genes slowly become more and more uh, popular or common within the gene pool. They start to dominate. So this is um, what we're talking about when we're talking about selection pressures. We're talking about this second component of these three very important parts of Darwin's theory of natural selection, variation, the selecting agent, and reproduction, that we can focus specifically on what sort of things can act as selecting agents. So when we start to look at the abiotic factors, these are the sorts of factors that can all act in different ways as selecting agents. These are all the sorts of factors that can act as selecting pressures that can shift populations and favour some individuals over others. Now, it may well be that we can talk about something like the availability of light. Availability of light is critically important um, for, for hunters, but it's also very important for plants. Most obviously, I guess, important for plants because of the process of photosynthesis. And if we want to analyse plants, one of the main ways that we can do that is we can look at, at, at one of the important organs, the leaf, and see how this structure changes not only in its, its uh, overall appearance, but its um, distribution of cells, distribution of um, uh, chloroplasts or photosynthetic uh, organelles within the structure in order to take advantage of the amount of light that there is. And obviously, if a, a plant is um, in an environment where light is very highly available, so um, there's no shading, it's uh, all of the plants have got equal opportunity to get that light, then the size and shape may become less important than perhaps the availability of water, whether or not the plant is going to dry out. In an environment such as a rainforest, where you have um, a greater availability of light for plants in the upper uh, part of the forest, the canopy, um, it's the plants down the bottom, the ones that are sitting in shade a large amount of the time, that have less um, availability of light. Light is filtered as it comes through, and they may not get much there. So they need to be able to take full advantage of any light that they do get. And of course, that means things like um, large surface area. Always important to talk about surface area in biology, even if you're not sure, because it's so often a critical factor and something that we can link to the structure of all sorts of different biological um, organisms and also organs and cells. So the large surface area um, increases the efficiency of, of taking in that light and to be able to use that for processes like photosynthesis. 
So what we want to do is we want to have a look at some specific examples of where these types of abiotic selection factors may have um, had an influence on the structures uh, of different types of organisms. One other little thing before we leave this video here is that obviously there are a number of different types of uh, environments or ecosystems and we have defined or we've said that we can define them on the basis of the dominant plant species. But we also need to remember that um, there are two uh, other ways that we can split uh, or there's another way that we can split uh, ecosystems in two and that is on the basis of whether they're on land or in the water. So terrestrial environments are environments where we are predominantly talking about land-based plants and animals and aquatic environments for water-based um, plants and animals. And of course, aquatic environments will include freshwater environments like streams, rivers and lakes, as well as uh, oceans where it's very salty and even mangrove environments where there's intertidal, where water, fresh water is mixing with um, uh, salty water and you're getting that kind of mix occurring at a delta or something like that. So ecological principle number two, and I said I would throw a few of these at you during this topic, uh, ecological principle number two is that in terrestrial environments, net primary production, a primary production is basically what happens with the plants. Um, so pri net primary production, NPP, is regarded as plant biomass or the total amount of matter that's locked up within plant tissue. Uh, and generally speaking, in a terrestrial environment, the limiting factors are temperature and water supply. And that makes sense. If the temperature gets too high, if the water availability gets too low, plants will dry out. They may have to use strategies to help keep them cool, which may or may not involve the use of water. And of course, this um, can severely limit their water supplies. So often temperature and water are key limiting factors in terrestrial environments. On the other hand, in aquatic environments, there's plenty of water. Not always is that water available um, in a form that the, that the species can use it. So in a, a salty environment, in an ocean, for example, the salt content may actually make the water not drinkable. Um, that doesn't mean that no organisms will drink the water, or at least take in the water, because we know that fish are very, very good at doing that. But they have to have some other strategies as well in order to cope with the extra salt levels. But in an environment where it's very fresh, the amount of um, ions or substances dissolved in the water may be very, very low. And hence, in aquatic environments, the net primary production or the, the growth of plant tissue is, is more often likely to be limited by nutrient supply. That is, ions, uh, other, other important biomolecules that are present in the water, or at least when they're absent in the water, may actually affect the uh, growth of plants. And we know that happens with things like eutrophication, where we, where we put extra nutrients in and we get uh, uh, algal blooms. We get plants growing too quickly um, and potentially choking systems up. So this is our second ecological principle, and it fits nicely in with this idea of selection pressures based on abiotic factors. What are the physical and chemical factors in the environment that can actually shape populations? So let's have a look at a few of examples of those in the classroom and thanks for watching.